So welcome everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome my longtime colleague and friend George Bigler from the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, George did a bachelor's degree in chemistry at Duke University, and then he migrated westward to Stanford Medical School, where they had just established a new neuroscience program and a new medical school when he moved to, from San Francisco to Palo Alto. And George was actually the second student to enroll in the neuroscience program at Stanford. And he did an MD PhD degree, and along the way through that program, he got more and more interested in basic science and less and less interested in clinical science. And he said that actually when he looked back at the course catalog, that he found that he had checks next to all the basic courses and X's next to all the clinical courses. So he transitioned to basic research and he was then uh, invited to be to take Don Kennedy's neurophysiology course. And Don had about 50 students. Don ultimately became the president of Stanford, the head of the FDA, the chief editor of Science Magazine. And Don invited George to participate in a small laboratory group and uh, George not only was a student in the group, but he actually wound up being a TA at the same time. And that's a challenge to take a course and be a TA at the same time in that course. But he did a great job, and that's where I met him. And then Don invited George to work in his laboratory. And Don was working on the physiology of networks, organization in crayfish, how do crayfish behave, and what's the organization of the nervous system. And so George worked on crayfish neurophysiology. That was a long way from the medical school. You can see the medical school over there in the biology department here, but they really didn't talk to each other. So crayfish neurobiology, as George will tell you today, is what's led him to some really interesting studies about mammals and humans and how we can improve regeneration. So after George completed his PhD at Stanford, he went on to UCLA where he did a postdoc. And he then spent that time in the next few years working on biophysics of synaptic transmission. He then left and went to the University of Texas in Austin, where he is currently professor of neurobiology. Uh, along the way, he's made major contributions to neuroscience in the realm of biophysics of synaptic transmission, nerve regeneration, glial cell function. And in 1992, he was elected a fellow of the AAAS the American Academy uh, Association uh, of uh, the AAAS, Make Science Magazine, you know? it's the American uh, Association of Advancement of Science. I always want to say it, it's not like the, uh, the Oscars, you know, but it's sort of like <laughs> the Oscars of Science, uh, which is actually the largest science association in the world. And so George is a fellow of AAAS. And uh, he's going to tell you today about the studies that he's been doing for some years about nerve regeneration, starting in crayfish, and now transitioning to humans. So, let's welcome George. Thank you, Bob. Very much. Uh, yes, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is something that actually began. Uh, some 40 or so years ago, uh, and just starting to put it all together. That is, uh, rapid, effective, and permanent repair of seven limb nerves. It's not just for Mr. Krabs and Luke Skywalker anymore. Now, what do I mean by that? Mr. Krabs, those of you that have kids like I do, uh, is a character in SpongeBob SquarePants. Uh, I'm not sure my 14-year-old still watches uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. I do sometimes. <laughs> I do. Uh, and the reason for talking about Mr. Krabs in this case is that if Mr. Krabs gets some sort of damage to the nerve axons that run his uh, 
claws at the end of his limb, uh, he's actually able to repair that and return function within days. Most of the week or so. It's something that we spent part of our time uh, a couple of decades ago uh, studying. And I think we probably were the major lab studying invertebrate regeneration. Uh, unfortunately, however, if that happens in a mammal, a homo sapien, uh, the repair uh, usually isn't uh, so good or so rapid. Uh, that is, uh, as I'm pretty sure you're aware, that if you sever a mammalian nerve, the distal stump typically degenerates after it seals off very quickly it generates within a day or so. And if you get any regeneration, it occurs at about a millimeter or so a day from the proximal stump. And if you're exceptionally fortunate, that regeneration actually goes back to the right place. But if you do the math, and that injury occurs in your upper arm or your upper leg, maybe in the order of a meter or so away, from denervated tissues in your toes and your fingers. A thousand divided by 365 means it's two to three years before you start to get some function. And only then, and you only get that uh, if the axons regenerate to the right place. In many inverters that we study, like Mr. Krabs, you do the same set. You get the same sealing off of the proximal and distal rings. You get the same output at a millimeter or so a day, except the distal stump typically doesn't degenerate, but rather survives for weeks to months to years. And it's kind of an oddity, hasn't made it into major text, but it's probably what happens to most axons when you sever them on this planet. <laughs> simply because there are more invertebrates than there are vertebrate axons around. Uh, and that slowly outgrowing proximal uh, processes contact surviving distal stumps and activate them. Sometimes, by the most obvious means, that the proximal stump fuses with the distal stump. Membranes uh, uh, break down, between the proximal and distal stump, you have cytoplasmic continuity, uh, probably the most common idea in complete exome repair. For others, invertebrate cells, axons, it's not actually morphological fusion, but those outgrowing processes form the junctions with some cells, uh, some axons in surviving distal stumps, other cases, it may actually form chemical synapses. The most common means, though, of activating surviving distal stumps appears to be by the fact current spread. That is, uh, uh, essentially, extracellular spread of currents that are able to depolarize the surviving distal stump beyond the threshold. Uh, the distal stump then eventually degenerates, maybe after many months, uh, about the time that the proximal stump uh, uh, essentially regenerates to the uh, target tissue that the whole time essentially has been innervated by the surviving distal stump. So, now from some point early on, we started thinking about uh, how invertebrate regeneration mechanisms might somehow be used to improve regeneration in vertebrates, including mammals and humans. And there's been an awful lot of serendipity in all of this. Part of the serendipity was sometime in the mid-80s uh, mid or so, while thinking about this and having learned about a substance called polyethylene glycol, used by molecular biologists to make cell hybrids. Right? If you know a little molecular biology, you know you can make a cell hybrid. 
by taking well cell lines, suspending it in uh, uh, a flask, take another cell line, add something like 50% peg, shake for a minute or two, play it out, and you'll get you know, combinations of cells where the peg has allowed cells that come in contact with each other to withdraw the, uh, the cell uh, order that's bound to proteins on the outer portions of uh, membranes. If you withdraw the cell water with PEG, uh, the membranes can flow together and you get uh, multinucleate cells of different combinations of nuclei of the two cell types. And so with cell hybrids, for example, you can take a uh, cell line that, say, grows very rapidly, is very active, some sort of maybe cancer cell line. You can take a cell line that makes something that you're particularly interested in, uh, let's say insulin by pancreatic islet cells. Uh, you can create a cell hybrid of the two, so you get a very actively growing cell that expresses insulin into the media, uh, and you form, you know, the competitor with the Genentech or whatever. Right? Uh, learned about that in the mid 80s or so, and saw the Empire Strikes Back. You haven't seen it, your kids probably haven't. Right? But, you know, there's a scene in, it in which Luke Skywalker is fighting with Darth Vader with light swords, and Darth cuts off Luke's hand. I happened to see it late at night after working on some regeneration problems in crayfish in the theater in Austin. Uh, and I kind of fell asleep uh, at the time of the silver life. So I saw the hand cut off, but the next thing I knew, as far as I was concerned, uh, Skywalker uh, was in some sort of 23rd century space hospital. I thought he was getting his original hand re-sewn on and the nerves reattached. I fell asleep. Uh, my assumption was that, uh, uh, sure, Luke got his hand cut off. Uh, he caught it, though, probably stuck it in the, in the pocket of his robe. It's a family movie. There's not much blood. Uh, now he's getting it reattached. And the nerves are being... Uh, in his hand, the distal stumps are being fused with the proximal stumps in some sort of 23rd century operation. And I've got a fairly long drive home uh, from downtown Austin. And on the drive home, I thought, wouldn't it be neat if you could actually, if there was some sort of biological glue that you could do that with? Uh, and it suddenly occurred to me, wait a minute, uh, you know, I've been reading about polyethylene glycol and how it caused breakdown of cell membranes, use cell fusion. If you could fuse the membranes of two very different cell types, why couldn't you take two halves of the same cell, get them in close apposition, apply pain, and get one cell back again? So the very next day, actually, went to the lab, dissected out a crayfish medial giant axon. And those are axons you can almost see by naked eye. There were two 300 microns in diameter. Cut the thing, approximated the two ends, walked down you know, a few labs away, uh, borrowed half a cup of peg, and applied a little bit to the cut ends. Uh, stimulated the axon on either side of the cut, and the of action potentials didn't go through. Uh, fixed it, that one for electron microscopy, and darned if in different areas it didn't really look like there was uh, a fusion of the membranes of the two halves and cytoplasmic continuity. Part of the problem was the next third of the next 40 to 50 that we tried didn't work. But we kept at it because when success occurred, it was very dramatic. But it was about 3% of the time. 
gave the problem in the lab of those days to undergraduates. Uh, because heaven knows if there was anything that could be that uh, could be done as far as uh, petty fusion, even a giant inverter would act on the U.S. concerned. So it didn't seem like a good idea to give it to graduate students or postdocs that might like a publication uh, within a year or two. And one of them, Todd Krauss, uh, essentially said, you know, George, everybody knows that what happens when you sever axons, the membranes collapse and fuse. Right. Just like you made something out of saran wrap, and a tube out of saran wrap, cut it, eh, it would seal off at the ends. And you know what we're trying to do is to repair something that's collapsed and fused. That's kind of not the brightest approach. What you really want to do is open up those cut ends and now get them in close out position and now try to fuse them. Right. But incidentally, you know, everybody knows that if you've got open ends or holes in cells and calcium comes in, well, it's going to kill the cell. So if we're going to do this, we're going to have to do it in uh, a reduced calcium, whatever it is that we're doing, uh, so that we don't have lots of calcium rushing. So what we did was take hypotonic crayfish salines or earthworm salines, uh, eliminate all the calcium, sometimes adding uh, EGTA. Don't know if it didn't work. That is Todd and others in the lab, undergraduates or graduates at that point, were able to take invertebrate giant axons, uh, open them up with hypotonic salines, uh, add calcium, sorry, uh, in, in uh, zero calcium, and get repair 90 to 100% of the time. Now, when the, if you got action potentials and so forth on through immediately, but if you allowed the animal to go behave at that point, the strength of the repair at the site of membrane repair was very weak. Uh, the animal pulled apart, uh, repaired axons uh, rather quick. And the solution for invertebrates <coughs> was, well, anesthetize them for a couple of days. And you can do that with an invertebrate, just my crew. Right? Uh, or apply various sorts of we had hydrogels of different sorts around the connective tissue for increased strength, and uh, that also worked. It produced permanent repair. Uh, the peg acts within uh, uh, minutes after being applied, and now you had rapid, permanent, and effective repair of uh, invert reduction. The question then was, how do you apply this to mammals? In which you've got thousands of small diameter axons, all in parallel, you can't see the individual ones, and the hydrogels that we were using were toxic uh, when using mammals. Uh, it seemed like uh, we had a situation where maybe we could do this, right? But it didn't seem like uh, you know, we were going to pass various FDA inspections with that sort of approach. So the question was kind of laid aside, and it was laid aside as to what to do, in part because the other thing that Todd and several of us discovered was that when you severed nerve axons, actually the ends didn't collapse and fuse, like we thought it did in textbooks, including the <laughs> general, said it did. The problem was, if you look to see if there were any, what the experiment showed on that, you couldn't find it. It was just sort of, well, everybody knows that's what happens. 
just like everybody knows that the sun goes around the earth from east to west every day, you can see it, right? Why would you think otherwise? And instead what was happening was that vesicles were accumulating either at complete cuts or if you made a hole in the membrane, uh, vesicles accumulated to accumulate, they needed calcium. To interact and fuse, they needed calcium. And in fact, after 15 years or so of studies on it, we know a lot about what happens when you sever either invertebrate axons or vertebrate axons or any other eukaryotic cell, in fact, can do damage to the plasma lemma, either by complete transaction uh, or by making holes. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter what cell type you use in our lab or Steinhardt at Berkeley's or McNeil's at uh, Georgia Tech or a set of other labs that also have looked into it. In all cases, with different cell types, what you've got is calcium activating formation of vesicles that move to the site of plasma level damage and that require a set of biochemical pathways often acting in parallel using PKA or, e or EPAC or PKC uh, or DAG. Uh, and if this were a seminar on that topic, you know, one could talk about the different uh, proteins and other substances involved uh, and how they interact with each other and how all of the proteins in this pathway seem to be isoforms of proteins that are used in either synaptic transmission or in Golgi uh, uh, Golgi intracellular tract. In fact, our suggestion is this is the evolutionary origin of all of those proteins. And that in evolutionary history, those proteins were then co-opted for use probably first as uh, Sudoff and Rothman have suggested for uh, Golgi vesicular trafficking and then co-opted in turn for synaptic transmission purposes. But this is, we think, the evolutionary origin of those sets of proteins. But that's not the subject of you know, this particular talk. This particular talk, I want to concentrate on weird science, not the standard stuff you can get published in PNAS. Right? Let's continue going weird. Because what we have learned from the more standard biochemical studies are what sort of substances either increase sealing probability or decrease sealing probability, not only in axons but other cell types. And that's turned out to be very useful in the remainder of what I'm going to talk about. And part of the usefulness is, well, one of the pathways, in parallel with several others, is whether the substance <coughs> is, an oxidase, is an oxidizing or a reducing agent. That substances that are oxidizing agents increase the probability of sealing. Substances that are reducing agents decrease the probability. They inhibit vesicle formation. They inhibit vesicle interaction. And if one, to do these studies, we typically use rat hippocampal cells, a cell line called B104 cells. And what we do is sever a set of B104 cells in uh, tissue culture media 
that doesn't contain calcium, just uh, the transfer into a calcium-free media, just before we individually center a set of 40 to 100 cells in a dish. What we then do is add calcium, and as long as we don't wait more than 10 minutes to add calcium, all the cells seal uh, at a time dependent on when calcium is added, what we call post-calcium addition time. And if you take cells either that are greater than 50 microns from the cell body or less than 50 microns from the cell body, you can plot the time that on average it takes the cells to seal once you put them in calcium. And here would be two standard control curves. And then you can look and see what happens if you apply methylene blue, which is a reducing agent, uh, or, uh, or uh, uh, melatonin, which is a reducing agent. And it decreases the probability of sealing at most any time after you've added calcium. Whether you've done it, the cells that are transacted greater than 50 microns or less than 50 microns from the cell body. On the other hand, now decide to add polyethylene glycol and see what happens. What one notes is that sealing occurs instantaneously. Just as rapidly as you can make a measure. We don't know how quickly it occurs because the fastest measurement we can make is about a third of a second after we've added that. It certainly is less than that and we suspect it's within microseconds, actually. <coughs> we can also look and see at what concentration you get this very rapid sealing. And it turns out there's a dose-response curve that in some sense is U-shaped. That is, there's an optimum concentration for sealing for adding PET. You add too little, you don't get the full amount. You add too much, and you start dissolving the cell membrane. <coughs> and that decreases C. A toxic effect, if you want. Right. So what? Well, the so what is, a couple of years ago, now about two, we finally started to put it all together in what we call a set of bioengineered solutions that came about in combination very serendipitously. We started using methylene blue because a graduate student uh, that was in psychology was working with a psychology professor who studies stroke and found that methylene blue uh, uh, prevents uh, many of the consequences of stroke. Uh, he drinks a glass or two a day and was more or less insisting that you know, in our studies with one of his students, why didn't we try out, see what happened with Bill Why not? It was a good suggestion to say. Right? Same time. About the same time we got some dramatic results with methylene blue on crush axons, but not cuts, because with crushed axons, the, uh, uh, the epineurium, the perineurium, the endineurium, or at least the epi and the perineurium remain more or less intact. And if you've got a very short crush and you apply pegged and polyethylene glycol, you can get uh, a membrane repair. Uh, and then when the animal comes out of anesthesia, uh, it doesn't necessarily pull everything apart because the connective tissue has been broken. And because we had some early results on that, we got uh, some contact from a uh, orthopedic surgeon in Australia uh, going to Harvard by the name of Cameron Keating, and an orthopedic surgeon in at the uh, Vanderbilt Medical School, uh, who said, both of them, gee, why, have you guys ever tried microsutures to give mechanical strength 
through the uh, uh, through the epineurium and the peritoneum. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not that sort of town. Yeah. There isn't any around the lab, and there's no medical school around Boston. Uh, they said, well, why don't we come and try uh, micro sutures with uh, your combined solutions? And then each of them came separately the first time they tried it. It worked like a charm. And what was tried was, first of all, you make a cut. And now the end sought to seal off with accumulation of uh, vesicles that are calcium-induced. Uh, you sought to get sealing. Uh, you now put the, uh, the cut nerve in a calcium-free solution. Uh, often with melatonin or ethylene blue works best. That opens up the cut ends, get rid of vesicles that otherwise interfere with the action of PEG uh, on the plasma lemma itself. You now apply microsutures to bring the two cut ends together. After you do that, you then apply PEG in a calcium-free solution to get partial repair of the axolemma, the plasma lemma, of severed axons in a, sci in a sciatic nerve. And then you wash off the peg and you apply uh, physiological salines containing calcium so that you repair with vesicles remaining holes in the plasma level. Right? You do so, and if I can get this to run, let me show you the whole procedure takes about 20 minutes. I'll show you in, in the time lapse here what the whole thing looks like. Just about two or three minutes. You're opening up the, uh, to expose the nerve, expose about two centimeters, stimulate to make sure you get action potentials on through where you're going to cut the nerve, action potentials to then cut the nerve, no action potentials through. You then uh, do microsutures. And after microsuturing, you, and you're doing that in hypotonic saline, calcium-free, you're then going to apply PEG to, to the lesions. I'm, I'm sorry, PEG and uh, methylene blue, sorry. It makes a colored solution. You then suction off the peg in methylene blue and you apply uh, calcium containing savings. You then check out whether you've got action potentials going through again. And typically within two to ten minutes, you get action potentials going through again. Uh, and if you put one end in, in an intracellular dye, and ask, does it go through intracellularly through the lesion site? The answer is yes. <clears throat> you section up, so you suture uh, the wound site and return the animal to its cage and start doing behavioral tests. The behavioral tests that uh, we most commonly do, one is called the sciatic functional index, the other is called the football test. The sciatic functional index is certainly the more common of the two. It's fairly well known. It was developed by Medina Shelley, oh, maybe 25 years ago. And it's the, the heaviest contribution to the behavioral score is how well the animal uses its hind paw and toe spread. That creates the, that's the, in, in calculating a SFI score, 
in which intact animals are generally between plus or minus 10, and completely severed sciatic nerves in the upper five in the order of minus 100 in terms of a deficit. Most of the contribution to the deficit score comes from uh, 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 distal uh, muscle masses, as opposed to the footfall in which that tests how well the animal walks on a grid and uh, a greater contribution to that score comes from, uh, comes from muscles more proximal to the foot. You look in particular, we concentrate for now on SFI scores. What one sees is that if you don't do anything, you just cut and uh, uh, suit you uh, the wound area, return the animal to its cage, study it for 12 weeks, in fact, we've taken it out to 18 or 24, you see very little of it. They do the best surgical procedure around these days, a microsuture, and maybe you get 20-30% recovery. On the other hand, if you do microsuture plus uh, uh, melatonin, or microsutures plus methylene blue in green, you get dramatically increased recovery uh, after a cut. You look at what that looks like uh, behaviorally, and I'm afraid that uh, the last time we checked, we weren't able to got to do something different, actually, to get it to play. There we go. Okay, thanks. Uh, here's a sham operated. You ink the bars of the rat, different color on each side. Here's an animal that had a crush but no repair. A crush plus peg, and walking very well, and a crush plus methylene blue plus peg, Watch very well two weeks after surgery. You do a cut plus methylene blue two weeks after, three weeks after surgery. Watch very well. You look at sham operated foot faults. It's a little harder than to see the, the foot fault. It crushes, the leg falls through often. Crush plus methylene blue plus peg less often. And if you do cut plus methylene blue plus peg, again, uh, not very often. So, the bottom line is, the simple cuts, uh, we're able to get much more dramatic behavioral recovery uh, when we use uh, methylene blue peg reduced calcium and microsutures in a, in a particular sequence. Now, part of that's nice, and uh, we've got a case study going uh, in Thailand, actually, uh, doing a repair uh, just the other day on uh, a patient that had a digital nerve severed in his hand uh, and the uh, orthopedic surgeon there trained by uh, Dr. Thayer is doing the first uh, human case study that we're aware of. It'll probably be a couple of weeks before we know how well it works. But simple cuts are the, ones easy, are, the, are the ones that we can repair quite obviously, but they're not necessarily what happens most frequently in peripheral nerve damage. That is often in peripheral nerve damage, 
what one has in auto accidents, gunshot wounds, uh, improvised uh, explosive devices, whatever, is a loss of an entire segment of a peripheral. Now that's a different challenge because for the loss of an entire segment, it can't bring the two ends together and do a pay fusion. I've lost a couple of bets on this in the last several months. I hope I keep losing. Because what Dr. Thayer said, well, why don't we try doing an autograph, a double fusion, and just for grin, see how it works. That is, make a double cut in our standard, pretty much two centimeter exposure in a rat. Take out the segment, put it back in again as if it were an autograph, and peg fuse with our complete procedure both ends and see what happens. My bet is we'd spend quite some years getting if ever, uh, successful results. In fact, uh, within a month or two, uh, we're able to get rather dramatic results. That is, if you look at uh, the conduction, the compound action potential amplitude of all those axons generating action potentials, uh, before you made a cut, going through what's going to be the lesion site, you get a certain uh, amplitude extracellular response. Uh, you do your uh, double cut, your, your interposition autograph, you pay twice, and in fact you get a remarkable number of axons conducting all the way through the autograph as opposed to the control if you don't do anything. And in fact, if you look at how much uh, conduction you get as measured extracellularly, uh, three days later, uh, it's still quite substantial. You know, look at, this happens to be footfall. We've done it also for uh, SFI, you look at uh, the behavioral recovery. Three days later, or now three weeks later, uh, it's uh, dramatically better in uh, animals with autographs and double peg fusion than uh, in uh, non peg treated animals. You do MRIs of uh, sciatic nerves in rats uh, in which you do a simple cut and you don't do any peg fusion and you look how many surviving axons in red in this case uh, you have distal to the lesion site and you get some outgrowth. You look at what happens though in peg treated animals and it's consistent with sets of other data that we have that uh, after peg fusion, we're getting significant amounts of uh, distal stump survival. We're preventing, in other words, Wallerian degeneration. We've tried actually one step further, and that is doing autographs of segments removed is certainly a step in the <coughs> direction. But if you think about it from a clinical standpoint, it does you just so much good. That is, you get an auto accident, gunshot wound, IED, and you lose a segment of major peripheral. Where are you going to get your autograph from? That is, it's not like we just did a double cut and it's right there and you can take it out and put it back in again. In fact, it's gone. Mm -hmm. 
to do an autograph to get that sort of tissue, you've now got to go to some other major nerve and cut it and take it out and do the same end. You've got to create a lesion somewhere, take that nerve to, uh, say, the sciatic nerve, and you know, hope that the overall result is better than if you didn't do it. And often it isn't in real life situations. So what we decided to do was take, do a removal of a segment, all right. In this case, in our typical uh, rat that we use are spray dog rats. And then get an autograph from another rat, but not a spray dog. We took long embers, different strain, and put Juan Evans uh, uh, graphs from Long Evans donors into spray dolly hose. Double peg fused at both ends. And asked once again, what's the amplitude of action potentials going through, all the way through, immediately after uh, we do the surgery, within 10 minutes to half an hour, and the answer is, well, with autographs, you also get very good recovery. The, the exact amplitude you're doing extracellular reporting is, uh, is somewhat chancy and determined by exactly the position of your electron. And so in this case, we actually got a bigger signal going through in a set of rats uh, after allograph than, than in control. We then looked 72 hours later, uh, uh, sorry, unoperated controls versus severed controls. Severed controls get nothing on through, either immediately or 72 hours later, whereas when we use, when we use autographs in this particular set of experiments versus allographs, both of them led to uh, significant conduction of action potentials and significant recovery of behavior 72 hours there, thereafter. We've also done axon counts after allographs, autographs, uh, uh, proximal to the double cut within the graft itself and distal to the double cut. Uh, and in each case, with uh, autographs uh, or allographs, uh, we do significantly better than uh, 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 controls. And the behavior recovery is also significantly better. And it works not only for just acts on counts, but if we specifically identify motor axons versus sensory axons by antibody setting, uh, it works out once again that uh, after PEG uh, fusion, the number of sensory axons and number of motor axons is significantly greater. Uh, in this case, at 72 hours uh, after peg fusion. So what is that at that point? It seems like uh, this particular approach to instead of counting on axonal outgrows, to start looking at repair of peripheral nerves in this case, as if you're trying to mimic part of what happens in invertebrate re uh, repair, that in fact that can actually work. Now the question, one, that you should be asking before I stop here in a couple of minutes is, why does it work? That should be a 
becomes and certainly behavioral repair requires, one would think, specificity of re -innovation. Now, in our simple cuts, and in fact, in everything we do, we try to align things the best we can. And in simple cuts, you've got some morphological features of the nerve you can use to make an alignment as good as you can. But with hundreds of thousands of nerves in a rat sciatic, mixed sensory and motor, scattered somewhat randomly, there's no way it's believable that we're doing any sort of a uh, specific fusion of the original proximal and distal stumps in the mammalian nerve. It's not like Mr. Krabs, where we can see the nerves and do it nerve by nerve if we have to. Right? This is almost certainly random to some extent in simple cuts. Uh, repair of axons in the proximal and distal stop. And that doesn't begin to talk about allographs or autographs, right? in which the alignment in autographs is certainly chancier than it is in simple cuts, although you can again do your best. But in allographs, what the blank do you do? Right? Other than maintain rostral caudal organization, you've taken a segment of sciatic nerve from a different strain of rat, and you're putting it in as a donor tissue into a host rat. We use immunosuppressants. Uh, but that, in my opinion, isn't the real problem. The problem is, what sort of specificity are you really getting and why is it working? We don't know. The best suggestion I can make at this time is that it's a matter of relearning and perhaps some CNS respecification. that's producing the behavior. And the behavior that we're talking about is after <coughs> typically four to six weeks. But yet, if you followed what I've been saying, the repair as far as action potential <coughs> induction are through and dye diffusion are through occurs within the but that's not when you see the behavior of recovery. Behavior of recovery, the next day, is no better than uh, if you just made a simple cut. Now, it is the case that after you've made your paper repair, you're not going to get action potentials on through, but you can see the leg twitch, the, the toes move, whatever. But that's not a functional behavior. Right? It just says, okay, we got some motor axons reconnected, uh, but heaven knows what you connected it to. Those could have been motor axons connected to sensory axons, for all we know. And the behavior recovery starts, obviously, usually within a week, and is usually very obvious and reaching its best in the order of somewhere four to six, seven weeks. Again, we think that what's happening is relearning, retraining. One analogy that we might, uh, might use, and I'm not sure at all how good it is, is if you take a mammal, including Homo sapien, and you put contact lenses on them or spectacles that invert the visual field, you've got an organism that essentially is functionally, you know, not, it's not blind, but it doesn't know, it, it makes very inappropriate uh, behavioral responses to the visual environment. 
and, but that improves dramatically over a one to three or four week period. So that, you know, in some mammals, after four or five weeks or so, we can do things like play basketball, which is of some interest these days. Right? Putting an 18-inch ball through a 30, through a 20-inch hoop from you know 30 feet away uh, takes a certain amount of visual, not only visual acuity, but also how do you coordinate your visual input with your motor output? Right? Not sure that's what's happening, but what I do insist is that what the most important measure is in all of these cases is behavior. I don't care how many action potentials you get on through, or how many axons you count you're generating or going through, a real test is the behavioral function. And for some reason, that seems to be occurring. The other analogy I might make is giving a dead bumblebee to an aeronautical engineer and asking, what does it do? And, you know, the apocryphal story is, uh, well, your typical aeronautical engineer will say, I don't know what it does, but it certainly doesn't fly. Right? It's too fat. Its wings are too stubby. Everybody knows that the maximum number of muscle contractions per minute, per second you can get in a uh, mammal or any vertebrate is 40 or 50 per second per hummingbirds. And you do those calculations, and heaven knows what those wings do, but doesn't get it off the ground. Well, you know, that bone is <coughs> used in the past two minutes. That's the way. So something in your assumption is incorrect. Uh, for the case of bumblebees, it happens to be how insect flight muscle works, which is you know, very different from whatever you know about mammalian. Uh, we're not sure what sort of assumptions we should or should not be making with respect to explanations of what's going on uh, in these petty fusions to produce the behavior. But we've seen it often enough and in enough labs now that we're convinced it's a real phenomenon. Uh, and at that point, there are two things to be done. One, to make the phenomenon better. And two, to understand the mechanism, because understanding the mechanism often helps you make the phenomenon better. Yeah. So with that, uh, yeah, why don't I say that's as far as we're able to go so far on peripheral nerve repair and possible. Maybe I missed this in the, in the beginning, but is there much of a sense of why the ability to repair the nerves is lost in the first place in the amniotes? So in the, in the distinction between Mr. Crab and the in the rat, so why is the ability to, to regenerate the nerve lost in the first place? What's the not the ability to regenerate the nerve. It's the ability, in part, for just with some survival. Right? And... Uh, Lower vertebrates, in fact, we in Zobaly have shown many axons in uh, fish and amphibia survive as well very long periods of time. Now, these are CNS axons, and uh, the axons survive. They can mediate uh, reflex functions, but they never get repair uh, complete from the CNS. Now, that actually is true for most invertebrate CNS axons. They survive, but they don't repair. The distal stump repair, interestingly enough, is in the peripheral axons of various invertebrates. The distal stump survival uh, is the rule rather than the, than the exception uh, for most axons on this planet. And I suspect that mammals and birds are different. We've done some studies on it that's most consistent with it's got to do more with body temperature than anything else. That having headless pieces of cytoplasm 
uh, in an animal with a body temperature of 38 is just way too yummy for bacteria. Uh, but it's, it's also not as weird as you might think it is. That is, you do have cells that without a nucleus survive for 90 to 150, 180 days. Lots of them. They're called their blood cells. You've got others that survive without a nucleus for you know, either three score and ten or four score and ten, depending on what your desire is. Uh, they're called uh, crystalline lens cells that lose a nucleus sometime in fetal development and survive for the life of the organism, which in Homo sapiens is decades. Almost certainly, because after a stroke, uh, what you've got is, is an oxygen-deprived situation. In which some cells die, some cells almost certainly don't, and recover. some cells recover over time. And uh, there certainly is lots of opportunity for relearning, reprogramming in a mammalian system. One can say, for example, in our case, we most recently, just a very short time ago, started playing with spinal cords. Now, spinal cords, so far, we've had, what we've done is a rod block, which is a crush. We do a complete cut in the spinal cord, and we don't know how to attach, how to get the two ends to come together. Maybe if you're a spinal surgeon and you know how to do correct for rat scoliosis or something, you might bring those ends together. But that's way past our uh, surgical technical abilities. But what we do is a rod drop. Uh, if we don't apply pay, as per your question, you see, you don't do anything, you see some recovery over time in the standard behavioral test that's done at, uh, on uh, rats and other animals that have spinal cord injury, it's called the BCD test uh, for locomotion. And you see over a period of five, six weeks, a plateau occurring. If we add, do our, our sequence of uh, bioengineered pain solutions, we get a very significant recovery. It's not the dramatic recovery we see yet in peripheral matters, but then it took us you know, 40 years to get where we are in peripheral matters. We're hoping it doesn't take so long now that we've learned as much as we have for the spinal, but uh, it's the first attempts that we've made. Yes? It sounds like the adding equal weight to maybe as important as the repair of the nervous and brain plus. Yes. And that, um, I think you were saying as far as maybe motor and sensory, you're not sure what you're connecting. So when humans have rehabilitation, where I guess the rats don't. Well, you can actually, you can do rehabilitation. Part of what we do, I, I work with one of my colleagues on this, is Dr. Tim Schallert. Uh, and, and he's a, he's a rat rehabilitator. Uh, <laughs> And it is yeah, one of the world's leading experts on behavioral tests and recovery. And so just, you know, again, by serendipity, we have stumbled into, in part, Tim at UT, and you know, orthopedic surgeons outside UT. But, uh, without it, we would not be where we are. Yes, sir. So I'm wondering if in a nerve bundle, like the sciatic nerve, <laughs> Is there any redundancy built in such that you can have maybe 25 to 30 percent of the sensory and motor neurons connecting directly and this still get function? There have been many more, I think, and not, there have been a lot of redundancies in the second century. But the ones that I'm aware of, I'm aware of others, 
uh, on spinal repair have suggested that if you get even 10 or 15 percent uh, survival recovery, you get significant, very significant uh, behavioral recovery. It's not a linear uh, relationship. That is, you know, let's say you have the option of damaging you know, 100 percent, 75 percent, uh, 50 percent, or 25 percent of the nerve. Uh, and if you've got some behavioral measure that says, well, this is 100% recovery, uh, if you are able, 100% behavioral recovery, if you get 20, 25% of the uh, nerve surviving or regenerating properly, you may get 80 or 90% behavioral recovery, and the remaining 10 or 20 comes from the, the remaining 75% uh, <coughs> suggesting that, yes, there's either lots of redundancy or lots of ability to reprogram and maybe send out collaterals or whatever. Now, this is one of those things where, since we don't know what's going on, and we live in Austin, whose model is keep Austin weird, uh, we, we're doing our part, and we can think about weird things that might be happening. You know, like, for example, in that sensory motor uh, uh, reconnection of proximal and distal stops. Right. Well, you can think about, well, you know, if things go by slow transport uh, and outgrowth, it's a millimeter a day. If it's fast transport, uh, uh, orthograde maybe 100, 300 millimeters a day, retrograde 50 to 100. Well, that's a lot faster. And maybe if you have sensory motor uh, inappropriate connections, uh, you know, can you with can you respecify uh, something or perhaps the distal stop going to a sensory uh, uh, organ in the periphery, uh, maybe that gets respecified so it starts to send out collaterals to uh, uh, muscle masses and maybe withdraws uh, the uh, uh, sensory information. Uh, you know, it sounds weird, but uh, that would certainly that would certainly help, right? Or things like, well, you connected a, uh, uh, if it were uh, a uh, brachial plexus repair, let's say you connected a motor axon going to the biceps with one that actually goes to the triceps. Well, maybe you could get some peripheral signaling back such that you now send out collaterals that have a much shorter distance to grow uh, you know, to get to the biceps. Uh, you know, when you don't know what's going on and you got a weird result and you're thinking, well, maybe we've got to think about some weird things that might be happening. Uh, you start, you know, you start wondering whether there might be the neuronal equivalent of insect flight muscle. So it yeah. seems then that if you, if you could do these studies in transparent organs and you had some kind of transgenic fluorescent recorder, such as you might find in, say, the Casper and the Aquafish, that you might be able to address some of these questions. That, a similar suggestion was made, I gave a seminar at Duke yesterday, and a similar suggestion was made with respect to uh, 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 yeah, if you're thinking of zebrafish, and maybe you're thinking of mice, right? In which, yes, you've got various mutants that have uh, uh, labeling now of either sensory axons or motor axons or whatever. Uh, and that's not anything we thought about before, but it's something I sure would like to uh, speak with those that are doing it about and see if they're interested in any sort of collaborations, including zebrafish. 
would be what you want. Sure. I mean, we'd just delight it. Yeah. If you do that sort of work, um, maybe going back to the original model of the crayfish, where you can easily specify which is the motor, which is the sensory, where you have a much larger neuron, and, and really look at it that way. That way you're not looking at these complex bundles that you yes. tend to get in the, uh, in the bone groups. It's not quite the same system, but... Exactly. That's how yeah. You, yeah. you can certainly take sets of giant axons in invertebrates, Crustaceans, some of which are motor, some of which are sensory, and uh, see what happens. Uh, and you have no idea how much of a oh my star suggestion that is, because actually at the time that uh, we discovered the original head, I was looking for uh, ability to fuse uh, cells in crayfish. Uh, to see how specific uh, sensory uh, axons really were. Uh, and so I was looking for a fuse, something to do fusion, and all of the fusions at the time before PEG were done by viral uh, uh, infections, Sendai virus, whatever, uh, in which what did I say? The range of organisms or cell types that they worked on were very limited. And it didn't seem like, you know, chicken viruses were going to work in crayfish. Uh, and so when, we just, when I learned about pay, it, it very quickly led to thinking about you know, how one might do fusion. So you're, you're, you're quite correct. It reminds me of the old acetabularia, the old mermaid's water glass with the nucleus on the end of the cross which the species. Sure. And acetabularia looks like a nerve axon, right? And you sever the stalk, uh, you sever the stalk from the cell body, and you know the stalk survives for long periods of time. Except in that particular case, uh, it's because of uh, long lasting mRNA and transfer of RNA and ribosomal. So um, yes. we're going to hang out in the lobby for a little while. Dr. Bidner, in addition to the work that you heard about in teaching, also is the founder of two companies to detect environmental estrogens coming from plastic products and to develop new formulations for plastic products that don't release environmental estrogens. There are a few fires that need to be put out. So we're just going to hang out for a while in the lobby, and you're welcome to come out and talk about anything related to this or environmental estrogens and join us for a while. Let's thank Dr. Bill.